three, two, one. Never has there been a better time to be alive in human history. If you're not feeling it, you must discover why. Join Matthew Bolton in developing and applying a framework of objective optimism toward a flourishing life of meaning, health, and happiness. Here's your host, Matthew Bolton. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mr. Brightside. I'm Matthew Bolton. Today's show is an interview with guest Dr. Cameron Caswell. That's Dr. Cam. And Dr. Cam is a counselor who coaches parents and mentors teens, helping them together navigate adolescence. I was really interested in her approach. Uh, I really love her big idea that, you know, adolescence doesn't have to be this scary thing that we think it is. Um, and in fact, when you do think of it that way, when you expect the worst, you do get the worst. And she uh, wants to promote instead a positive, optimistic view of adolescence and that it can be a really wonderful time for both teen and parent. And uh, she really has a lot of ideas of how we can nurture that view and promote it and make it become your reality. I got a lot of um, very interesting insight in the interview and um, I found myself agreeing with pretty much everything she said. So, and, and more than that, I just had a really fun, uh, pleasant interview and I think that everybody can really enjoy it and get a lot out of it. Uh, one quick thing is the, uh, the there was a couple, couple times where she cut out a bit um, and I just done my best to kind of cut it up as nice as possible but just so if you're aware of that I think it'll be, uh, be a non-issue for you. So I just wanted to mention all that. Um, without further ado, let me take you to the interview. I hope you really enjoy it. Hi everybody, welcome now to our interview. I'm with Dr. Cameron Caswell. Uh, it's no secret that adolescence can be an extremely challenging time and often causes families to crumble from the stress and frustration it causes. Dr. Cam has met far too many parents desperate to do what's best for their teens and at a loss of where to even begin. So for the past 15 years, she's been on a mission to help as many parents and teens as she can to rebuild and strengthen their relationships through improved communication, deeper understanding, and renewed compassion and appreciation. Her goal is to empower you to raise your teenager with confidence and learn to motivate them to become a more cooperative, communicative, responsible, and compassionate human being. Even better, you'll also learn how to appreciate, even enjoy being around each other again. She brings to the table a wealth of information and experience, including a doctorate in developmental psychology, over a decade coaching parents and mentoring teens, a certification in professional life coaching, and several years teaching adolescent psychology at the college level. On top of that, she's a mom of a teen herself, so she understands yeah. firsthand the challenges of navigating adolescence. Her daughter shuffles through the adolescent greatest hits on a regular basis. That's attitude, moodiness, messiness. You get the picture. And you can be assured that she'll not only talk the talk, she walks the walk. All right. Well, Dr. Kemp, thanks for coming on. Thank you for, for having me. Yeah, all Great. right. Um, maybe you could start with just a brief history. We've got a little bio there, but how, you know, how did you, uh, what led you to this work you're doing now? And you know, Oh, sure. Who, who so <clears throat> who am I? That's a really good question. <laughs> well, I, I will start back with my teen years where my mom and I get along right. wonderfully now, but when I was a teenager, not so much. Um, we fought an awful lot and I remember feeling very disconnected and misunderstood. And fast forward, um, when I was getting my doctorate in developmental psychology, I was teaching an adolescent psychology class. And it was my favorite, it was my most favorite class to teach. And it was fascinating because I had a lot of students who were also parents. And they started coming up to me saying, Dr. Cam, what you're teaching in class is completely changing my relationship with my own teen. I get them now. I understand and that makes all the difference. And I thought, well, why don't all parents have this information? And my guess is they don't wanna spend 10 years and tens of thousands of dollars getting their PhD too. And so that's what I wanna do is I wanna take the information that I've distilled over the years and my own experience and bring it to parents so that they can use this information because my secret is that although parenting teens can be tough, it doesn't have to be as tough as we're making it. And it actually, believe it or not, can be fun um, if we know how to navigate it. That's very encouraging. And that's a very worthy mission. <laughs> so thanks for all that. And um, sure. you know, I don't have... 
yeah, I don't have kids myself, um, but I do have a lot of friends who have uh, teens and kids who will be mm -hmm. teens. Uh, my wife and I teach uh, students in our home and we have a lot of teenagers and almost teenagers. Um, and we not only just teach them, we're also mentors to them. We talk to the parents mm -hmm. a lot as well. So it's all about kind of help, you know, together in tandem with the parents raising these kids as well. Um, I have 100%. university students who are, you know, they're freshmen are 18, 19, and they're still, you know, so I'm I have a lot of teens I'm personally interested in. But more than that, I'm interested mm -hmm. on a societal level. Like I, I'm interested in having living in a good society, and it's you know, I, I'm not going to sing, but the children are our future, I believe, and uh, <laughs> they and, certainly and, are. <laughs> and I'm very concerned about how we're raising as a society and how parents are raising. So I'm really interested in the mm -hmm. subject. Um, I maybe want to start with beliefs about adolescence. So what do people believe about adolescence, and how does this set themselves and their kids up for failure? I love this question, Matthew, and it's my belief is that we we kind of go into adolescence with this big, this fear and this dread. And you talk to parents and the day their kids are born, they start dreading when their, teen, when their kids are going to hit adolescence. And before their kids can talk, they start having this fear of when their kid's going to yell, I hate you at them, right, when they're teens. And so we we brace ourselves through their entire childhood just ready for this adolescent storm to occur and we're going oh my god i hope i make it you talk to people going oh the, you know the teens are coming up or they're they're 10 and they're already acting like teenagers and i don't know what i'm do how i'm going to survive this and my belief is that because we expect the worst from adolescence, that's exactly what we get. We're right. so focused on finding evidence to support our fears. And a lot of parents will go like, but no, it's true. And I said, because that's what you're focused on. If you focused on the things that make adolescence amazing, and I'm like you, I mentor a lot of teens as well. Not only do I have my own, but I have a lot of teens in my home and have these discussions. And these are some of the most passionate, um, compassionate, deep thinking, loving, just faithful, these people, they're just amazing people. And I will talk to these very kids' parents who are struggling with them and fighting with them and frustrated with them. Like, are we talking about the same people? But they're looking for the very things to support these negative beliefs. Wow. Yeah. And that's a lot of what uh, interested me in, interested me in you. Um, just this kind of idea of focusing. And this is obviously my, my theme, broad theme is optimism mm -hmm. versus pessimism. And optimism for me doesn't mean to pretend something is what it isn't or vice versa. It means to look at something right. and focus and nurture certain aspects of it. And that kind of becomes your reality of the thing. So what you're saying about exactly. you expect the worst, you're getting the worst. That's pessimism. You expect good things, mm -hmm. you're going to build good things. I just love the sound of all this stuff. So um, what should people expect and believe out of adolescence then? Like, well, one thing I, I want to set, I want to set it straight that yes, there are things that come with adolescence. And I think it's understanding, right? I mean, yeah. adolescence is a very different stage from childhood and adulthood. Yeah, I'm, and I'm not, not trying to say. I'm not denying that. Yeah, I'm not denying that at all. And it is a very, but when we understand what's going on and why, we can approach it a lot differently. Yeah. And the really, the key thing to really understand is the brain is going through one of its biggest growth spurts. It will ever, the only other time it goes through as big of a growth spurt is when it's they're infants, right. right? And then we're growing in size. And when we're teens, our brains are growing in density. And this is happening at a rapid pace. And it's it's called plasticity. And okay. at this point, they are learning so much information, but they're also developing um, unevenly. So the back of the brain, which is where the amygdala is, which is the emotion center, that is growing far faster then the prefrontal cortex, which we know is the executive functioning, which controls and manages the emotions. So teens are guided and led and driven by their emotions, by their instincts, and they don't have the full capacity yet to manage those and to rein those in. And so when parents go in, into these relationships and we often get triggered by our teens and we get very emotional and very upset, the problem is when we do that, our teens don't have the capacity to be the ones to calm things down. 
right. to things spiral out of control. And it's so we have to, to be the, the adults. We have to be the adults. And parents don't like that when I tell them that. They don't okay. like that. Right. Um, but we do. We have to be the adults. And we have to understand that if we want things to calm down, we have to calm them down. So I want to be clear that adolescence can be very tricky. But if we navigate it the right way, it can be really exciting because this is when kids are are developing their identity. They're, they're coming into their own of what their passions and beliefs are. They start having these really deep conversations and understanding the world at a level they've never been able to understand before. And you can just, they want to dig deep. And so you can really dig deep with them if you're giving them the opportunity to do that. Right. And I've certainly not thought about it too deeply or understood that the actual psychological and developmental aspect of it and mm -hmm. doing that is very empowering. And it's the whole thing is encouraging because when you're looking at something as something you understand, you can appreciate it and not get too worked up about, you know, if you don't understand something, you can be more fearful and, and confused about it. But already I'm getting encouraged. Yeah. Um, how, how, yeah. is this, <laughs> yeah, how is this? How is this? this kind of these beliefs that we kind of, or expectations, how is that related to belief systems that we grew up with? Parents, like why do they? Well, yeah, so I think a lot of it is, you know, the way teens are portrayed. In adolescence, the teenage years are really only about 60, well, no, I guess they're a little bit longer than that, but they're not, they haven't been around that long. It really started with the start of the high school. And we started putting this age group together and all of a sudden this whole network of people, this whole peer group became to show. And now we've seen it with tweens as another one. And it's actually is a advertising demographic that they initially target these goes, these people going, Ooh, look at this demographic. And so we've now created this whole persona around what teenagers are. And we see how they're portrayed on TV, in the movies, ever since like James Dean and the Rebel Without a Cause, they've been looked at as very, as terrifying <laughs> creatures, right? We also remember our own adolescence. And yes. I'm sure all of us have plenty of stories of how tough adolescence was. I don't know a single soul that would like to go back and relive those years. The problem <laughs> is we remember the bad stuff, because that's what's more salient. Those are the things that cause more emotion typically. So we remember uh -huh. a lot of bad stuff. And we yeah. just, we also hear stories. And so we propagate this belief of how terrible adolescence is. Mm -hmm. And we keep, we just pass that on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And it, it it's to the point now where I don't think anybody even realizes is that it's a belief, it's not a fact. I love that belief, not a fact, because that's what I think about almost most things, right? I mean, there are facts mm -hmm. and there are mm -hmm. ways to look at it and that becomes what the facts are um, in your Correct. world anyway. Um, so I, I would like to break, get into prime. This is your kind of me a method or a framework, mm -hmm. I suppose, to, uh, to approaching uh, an adolescence. Can you break it down? It's an acronym. So can you break down mm -hmm. prime? Tell us what it is. Abs absolutely. So the P in prime is the problem. And a lot of parents will come to me and say, my child is so disrespectful, or they're defiant, or they're, they're really anxious. And that could mean a lot of things. That's a very vague, broad term. And what I do is I work with the parents to get very specific on what exactly do you mean? When you're saying defiant, is that to everyone? Is that to you? Is it all the time is that specific situations what's the behavior so we get very very specific and once we get specific i can't talk once we get specific then we can i know right then we can actually start addressing it um but when you have this big vague huge thing how do we even start to address that and we also end up starting to label them as oh you're just a you know a bratty kid well, mm -hmm. what does that mean? And if I'm a bratty kid, my belief of myself starts falling into I'm a bratty kid and I start acting bratty. And we start looking for their bratty, bratty behavior to support our belief that they're bratty. And yes. we just kind of get in this big, vague, you know, so that's the first thing I do. Yeah, I get the that other it's one, like, we, it's like if I say, excuse me, just I want to get the no, little bit please. of, it's, it's, it's like if I just came to you and said, you know, Dr. Kim, my kid's just really disrespectful. Like, what are you going to do with that? And what am I going to do with that? Is, is you're saying we've got right. to, your first move is get down 
uh, to clarity. Okay, I like the sound of that. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Go on with reason. No, please clarify with me because yeah. it, it helps to help make sure I, I live this stuff. So it helps other people to yeah. ask questions so I can make sure I'm being clear on what I'm, what I'm trying to convey. But sure. the second one, which we just talked about a little bit is the reason. Right. So I, I actually have kind of broken it down into four main reasons teens act the way they do. And I, I've used another acronym. I love acronyms. They help me sure. remember stuff. Um, so this is teens beat, you know, march to the beat of their own drum and we got the drum. So it's development, which we just talked about with the brain, right? It's the relationship. Where is your relationship with your team? And this is really where we get into emotional currency. And mm -hmm. are you, are you having conversations with them or are you mostly fighting with them? Um, are you building trust and respect? The next one is understanding. Do they even understand what, what you're asking? We, we think things are so obvious, like take out the trash or go to up and do your homework, but we're not clear on when, we're not clear on exactly what that means. And so when our kids don't do exactly what we have in our mind, we think that they're misbehaving when really they just don't understand. It's about their um, understanding, okay. It's about their understanding of what we're saying, right? Yeah. And the final one is motivation. Like, we want our teens to do stuff, but why? Like, if we if we get frustrated because they won't put their phones down, well, what's their motivation to put their phone down? What is their why to it? And so a lot of times, uh, sleep is a good one too, where parents are like, well, my teen won't go to sleep until really late and they don't get enough sleep. And so, well, do they even care to get another, enough yeah, sleep? Right. What's their motivation? So we need to find what motivates them and what motivates them what we we kind of create these false motivations where we say well, i'm going to take your phone away i'm going to ground you i'm going to take this privilege away but that mm -hmm. doesn't motivate them to do the right thing that motivates them to avoid getting in trouble yeah there's a lot of ways to avoid getting into trouble which doesn't always count doing the mm -hmm. right thing right mm -hmm. so that's a big one with that so that is the r the I, and I'll go a little bit faster because it's a lot, the I's intention. Okay. So that's really, what is my intention as a parent? What do I want? What do I want to teach them? Um, most of the time we get stuck uh, in being a, in reactionary mode. And I think a lot of us parent from this knee jerk reaction of my kid just acted out or they did something, I need to stop it now. Or I don't like, I don't want them to treat me that way. And so we don't think long term. We think about shutting it down short term. We don't think about what's the long-term goal. What are we trying to teach them? Which could be take a little bit longer, but in the end, you're giving them the skills they need. Um, mind is what you're going to love is the mindset. And I think this is a piece that a lot of people don't talk about is the mindset. Yeah. Um, we don't get into this. We don't, and it, it's the, you know, the growth versus fixed mindset is essential for us to understand as parents because we mm -hmm. don't want to label our kids and we don't want, as I was just saying with the brat, like we don't want to label them and we don't want to put them in this place where they feel like there's no way for them to change. They just mm -hmm. are. We want to say, so a good example is I had a parent come to me the other day that said, my, my teen is just a big fat liar. I don't know what to do about it. He lies all the time. I think there's a problem. I think, I think there's some, something's not right. And he's a liar. And we worked on it and I had to change, we changed and changed the language to my teen has a habit of lying. Huh. Yeah, that's and it's, very good, go on. It's right. So when you're a liar, you can't change, you just are. And so everything you do and everything you look for supports that liar. When you have a habit of lying, that's changeable. Now we can address that as an issue and say, you're a good, you know, there's nothing wrong with you there's a habit we don't like. Let's it see what sounds we can like, find that habit. It sounds like that parent was missing a lot of prime, you know? Yes, like just, yes. Just no understanding, no understanding the problem. What is the reason? What's the, what are the intentions? What's the motivation? I mean, and then also labeling a like fixed mindset, which I would consider a very All of pessimistic it. view and versus growth. Yeah. Thing. Well, and I love that you just brought that up because one of my – one of the points that I'm always standing on is if you get these first four things right, which most parents 
don't even focus on. You don't need to get to the fifth one, which is, I call it empower. Okay. But this is where it's the parenting skills, right? So this is where people are like, well, how do you set rules? How do you set boundaries? How do you make sure they set consequences? And these are all important things to know how to do, but it's how we do them. And it's mm -hmm. why we do them. And if we do the first four things, we don't have to often resort to a lot of these other things mm -hmm. that are really kind of the last, last ditch effort. And I focus more on how to use that to teach them these skills, problem solving, decision making, anger management, like all of these things are kind of in there. Mm -hmm. I will, I have a 14 year old daughter. I have never once taken her phone away from her and not because I'm an easy parent. She's right. very, she helps around the house. She does what she needs. That's not the way I parent. I don't resort to taking things away. We work through what is her motivation and her drive is intrinsic motivation rather than the external motivation. All right. Got it. Um, why do you think parents these days seem to have trouble setting boundaries and enforcing consequences? Or is that just my view that it's different these days or something else? Okay. And why, why it, do you it, think that it, right. So it's always kind of been this pendulum swing. And I think this is true pretty much across the board with everything, but parenting, you see this very clearly. And so we go from really strict authoritarian parenting where the kids don't have a say it's our rules. It's just go. And we, we get raised that way. Way and we're like, well, that sucked. We didn't like that at all. So now I want to be the other way and I want to be understanding and let my child have a view and a voice. But we go so far the other way that we end up being permissive and we just say, you know, we let them do whatever they want. And as we talked about, teens don't have this executive functioning to make great decisions. So we need some boundaries and we have trouble establishing boundaries because we have trouble enforcing boundaries yes and what yeah and and i think particularly when we're so busy and we're so tired and we're so overwhelmed the second our kids push back um we we can give in and this once we give in we have just lost so much footing on our authority because now they know that they can push us to give in and they will outlast us every single time they yeah. just will but the clarity the piece that i'm always telling people is we want to teach them why so we need a why the because i said so no longer works yep. and that's why they're going to push back because they don't get it they need to learn so we need to be very clear in our why mm -hmm. we need to listen to them and make sure that they know that we're taking their thoughts and opinions into account and this is necessary because we're teaching them how to make these decisions. Right. Okay. And I tell parents a lot, I go, I tell parents a lot, think of it this way. If right now the only way you get your kids to do something, the, something right or something good is by taking away stuff, you're setting them up so that you now have to follow them around the rest of their life, mm -hmm. taking away their phone. And this is why they go into business, they go into the offices and they're like, I don't know. I don't know how to motivate myself. I don't know what to do. I'm scared of making my own decision because my parents always made decisions for me and I don't trust my decisions. So we get these kids that are just kind of paralyzed. Right. I see. So it was because I said so is no good, but also giving them no, not understanding the why. I wonder because I said so if it ever worked, right? Because even then it's lacking the why it's lacking the building uh, their internal motivation and then teach them how to right. be independently effective. Um, I mean, younger kids, you can't necessarily rational with, rationalize with. So, and yeah. they're more open to, okay, mom said so, then I will. Teens, no. Yeah, I it, think there has to be an aspect of that in what the young people cannot understand. Just because yeah. I said so, yeah. that is, that's the reality. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, teens, I, no. I wonder this, um, how, how do we deal with the, with the influence of peers uh, it's particularly like older, older peer, like peers or friends or cousins or somebody that, that they maybe look up to and maybe we don't approve of. So how do we deal right. with that kind of situation? The one thing I think that's really important at this age is to continue having a relationship with your team, understanding that they're going to be turning to peers. Peers become extremely important to them. 
but they also become important to them because they no longer feel like they can turn to their parents a lot of times. And I, I have parents a lot going, my teen, I want my teen to come down and talk to me. They just won't talk to me. They won't come down. They won't open up. And I say, well, is it safe? Or are you going to start freaking out? or questioning or fixing or judging or, or criticizing, which we tend to get into these phases. And so kids, every teen I have talked to without fail has wanted to have a better relationship with their parents and does not know how because well, they don't feel like the, they, they absolutely do. And the thing they want the most is for their parents to listen without trying to lecture so that's one of the things I teach a lot is how to listen. All right. Um, the other thing they want is just to laugh with them. Like they want to be able to tell a joke and have their parents laugh at it and think they're funny. Okay. This has come up so many times. They just want to have fun and have that relationship. And if we have that open relationship with our kids, we're going to continue to have positive influence on them. So when they come to this relationships that we're, we're questioning, we already have a trusting relationship where we can say, I'm concerned about this and this is why. But if we don't have that relationship and we say, I'm concerned about this, we've just made that friend the most desirable friend on the planet because they want to do whatever, the opposite of whatever we say. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, I'm going to move into a bit of a personal context. You say you have a daughter. Okay. You, ad you adopted your daughter. Is that right? I did. Yes. Why, why did you decide? Okay. Why did you decide to adopt a daughter, if you don't mind? No, I love telling the story. So okay, great. I have always, and I think we always kind of have visualizations of what we're going to be when we grow up, right? And one of the things I always knew was that I was going to be a parent. I've always loved kids, and even when I was single. I would go to my friend's house. They would all be married with kids. I'd be the single chick and I'd be the one in the living room on the floor playing with the kids. And they're like, ooh, Aunt Cam's here, you know? And mm -hmm. I just have always loved that. And I'm not going into my relationship issues, but not so good at that. Um, so when I, got, when I got into my 30s, I said, okay, I'm going to have, I'm not gonna let this part of my life dictate this part of my life. And I've always wanted to be a parent. So I made the decision and I had told my friends, I said, when I turn 35, I'm going to adopt. And I turned 35 and unfortunately none of them forgot that. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> um, you know, I was like, oh no, why did I put that out there? And then I woke up one day and I go, okay, I'm ready. It was just weird. It was like, I've got a great job. I've got a great friend, supportive family, all this stuff. And I decided now's the time. And it's really strange if you've, and I'm sure you have done this, Matthew, where you just know, and you just kind of, no matter, it might be big and it might be scary, but you just know. And I just knew, and I just jumped and it was and ha it continues to be the best thing I've ever done and most rewarding thing I've ever done. And the support that I got for it was astounding. Everyone in my family was like, it's about damn time that uh -huh. you did this. Yeah. Like, what have you been waiting for? Um, some of my friends thought I was a little crazy, but now they're like, okay, now we get it. We understand. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, it's, I, I talk to a lot of other people trying to make this decision because I think it seems scary to a lot of people. And I go, it's, it's not like, if that's what you want, you got to do it. Well, that's uh, very good. Well, congratulations on going through with it and enjoying it and, you know, and just yeah, upgrading your life in that way. That's how has right. your, how has your professional experience uh, informed your parenting and how has your parenting informed your professional experience, uh, practice. Ooh, that's a good one. I don't think I've ever been asked that at all. Um, <laughs> well, it's so, <laughs> I know, right? Hmm, let me think. The pa I mean, obviously parenting my own teen feeds in with my, how I help particularly the parents. Um, okay. oh. And it's very hard, you know, I, I've been doing this and I've been helping parents for a long time before I even had my own child. And there was a lot of things I understood about teens, but from the parenting perspective, there's things that I understand a lot more. And I think I'm a lot more um, 
tolerant, <laughs> I guess, yeah, of yeah. some of the things, a lot more patient, a lot more understanding mm -hmm. of where parents are coming from and their frustrations with it. So, and I've experienced myself. The other thing is I believe what I say and what I do a lot more because I mm -hmm. practice it every day and I see it work. All right. And that gives me some credibility to parents when they see my relationship with my own daughter, they they will say, I want that relationship. What do you do? Mm -hmm. And I can say, this is what I do. Right. But I also, I, you know, I work and I, I actually have several clients now that are my daughter's age and mm -hmm. I see the things that they are struggling with and the things that we're talking about. And it just, it helps me be very open with my daughter and say, I hear these are issues and we are, we talk about them all. Mm -hmm. So we, I get out in front of so many things and we're just very open about everything. And so there's very little out there that we have not discussed and put on the table. All right. Yeah. You got, it sounds like you've got your own insider in there. You know, you go to your daughter and say, I do. what's up with this one? How, why, you know, I, you well, I do. I'm like, can you, can you get me on TikTok and show me TikTok? What is this thing? TikTok they talk about. I still, I don't, I still don't know what TikTok is. Like I, I'm aware of what that name, I don't know what it is. Uh, it's an app and I actually did a dance with my daughter, which I highly encourage people if they have kids on TikTok, do a dance with them. They love it. All right, there you go. A little <laughs> bonus advice there. Um, you mentioned that you you, uh, you coach parents and you mentor teens. So, what are some differences in your approach like to dealing with parents and dealing with teens? Like, what does that look like? Oh For yeah, example, there's so. right. So, I actually one of my favorite things to do, but it's it's hard is to work with them together. And I like to work with them together because my goal is to. It, extract myself from the relationship once I get them on the right path. Okay. So, and I think if we, you know, if I, if I work with teens, which a lot of parents want me to, you know, fix their teen, I can do a lot with their teens, but if I throw them back into the same dynamic, it, they can revert back to what was going on. Right. Um, parents I like to work with because I can help them understand what's going on with their teens. And that can be a challenging one because t parenting is a very sensitive, full of landmines and people don't like to, they don't want to feel like they're doing anything wrong. And my whole approach is you're not parenting wrong. You're not broken. Your child's not broken. The, the communication is broken. The relationship is broken. And that's what I want to help you fix. And so that's what I really get in on. But the parents I mainly focus on understanding what their teens are going through and how to approach that differently. The teens, I focus mainly on self-esteem, um, building up their resilience and understanding their parents. I've had to do a lot where, you know, they'll come to me and say, my parents are doing this. And I'm like, I, you know, I'm not working with them, so I can't approach that, but let me help you figure out a better way to approach your parents that hopefully will, you won't be getting into trouble or getting yelled at as much or, you know, kind of how to understand that and navigate that. Okay. Uh, there's lots of value in that answer. Um, I want to just hit one thing. It just uh, popped out to me. I heard, I've heard the word resilience pop up a lot uh, with a lot of recent guests and stuff like that. And I hadn't heard much of it previously. Mm -hmm. what, so what, what is, why, what is this concept of resilience to you and what is, why is it important? Resilience is to me is being able to keep, going. It's that you get knocked down, you get back up again, right? Um, it's being able to take hits. And I think resilience now is probably coming up an awful lot because of COVID and having to adapt to that, right? So I'm sure you've had a lot of conversations around this and, and that comes up a lot because we worry about it because there's a lot of things that we know are good for our, net, our children's healthy development that they're not getting anymore. I mean, socialization is an enormous one. And that's been one of the things I've talked about the most is how do you deal with the lack of socialization during a time when socialization is essential. And so talking about resilience, saying there's things we can do, we don't have to worry that all is lost. Um, that you know they're going to be bouncing back. My only thing with resilience is 
that I tell parents is I don't want that to be your parenting strategy. Oh, they're resilient. They'll survive this, right? I can mess up as much as I want and they'll survive. It's great fallback. And it's a great to know that, you know, if you're a paranoid parent, it's great to know you're not going to totally mess up your kid if you make some mistakes. But um, I think that it's really important. I can't think of a more important job and we prepare for every job we ever do. And we need to be qualified and we want to do our best job. Why wouldn't we want to do that as parents? Yes. Yeah. And I heard in that um, people at first I was thinking, oh, I, I was going to ask you, why do you think I wonder if teens are not um, it's just harder to be resilient as a teen. I think that's just a, an, an age of a little sensitivity. But then yet yeah, then you mentioned that parents kind of say, well, teens are resilient so I don't have to worry too much. And then I thought, oh, but it is kind of true. They are quite resilient, maybe more and more so than, than adults in other ways. So I'm really confused now whether I think teens, you know, innately have more resilience or not. So let me put it this way. Um, yeah. Teens are, humans are resilient. Yeah. Teens actually as we just talked about with the brain, the teen brain is forming at rapid speeds right now and it's creating all of our connections. So it's creating our belief systems, it's creating our identity, it's creating how we see our world, our mindset, all of these things, our skills, all of these things are building when we're teens. Mm -hmm. By the time we reach about 25 or a little bit later, it's not like my 25th birthday, I'm done. <laughs> it's, you know, it's around that age. Yeah. Um, our, our brain slows down and it starts going more into pruning mode. Um, we can still learn, but the habits we've created, the mindset we've created when we're teens. And, and I know a lot of people who are struggling with things like addiction or just insecurities, they formed when we were teens. And we will spend the rest of our lives trying to compensate and fix these things that were created when we were teens. So we can do it. But if we can help our kids form positive mindsets, positive self-worth and identity, good habits, when they're teens, we're going to set them up for great success because they're not going to spend the rest of their lives trying to compensate for those because we've set them up. So that is the window of opportunity. And it's also the window where we can do some serious damage. Mm -hmm. I say amen to that uh, for sure. And you mentioned COVID and that's kind of where a little the category, I guess I want to go now. Um, what social impact has social distancing had on teens, do you think? And how can we help with that as parents? You mentioned, you hinted a bit already, but. Yeah, so COVID has had some pretty, I, I will argue that teens have been hit the hardest in terms of age demographic. I, I'm, I'm not going to go out there and argue because I know so many people have been hit in so many dis, dis, difficult ways. But I think in terms of age demographic, because teens is the age where we are so dependent on our peers to start defining who we are. Mm -hmm. We turn to them for our own, you know, for just for consolation, for their, everything. I don't, I'm not, I'm just not even saying it well. Peers are essential to teens. Let's just say that. Peers are essential to teens. And having this interaction and having, we, we need contact. So one of the things they're not getting is this interaction that is not just 2D, one-on-one -on -one like this. It's the passing people in the hall. It's the, you know, watching what other people are doing. It's having the crush on the boy next, with the locker next to you. It's, you know, seeing what people are wearing. It's just all of this that they're not having. And this is, these are the experiences that help them determine who they are. Um, these, you know, group interactions and being in clubs and doing all these things. They don't have this now. And the other thing is teens are at the stage where they need to develop autonomy from their parents. Doesn't mean you can't have a good relationship, but they are going to be pushing you away because they're trying to say, I am unique from my family, which is a lot of reasons why teens will do exactly the opposite of what you say. Don't take it personally. That's just what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And now they're stuck at home with their parents. Yes. Good. Um, good repeat. So this is... 
Yeah. So this is mortifying, right? So this is, this is really tough. It's like the opposite of what they need right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think a lot of parents, we, we fear social media and devices for good reason. We don't understand it. There's some scary things that can happen, but I think it's also, we don't understand that this is how kids communicate even before COVID. This is how they communicate. Mm -hmm. And when we hold them back, from that we're actually providing mobilization is already difficult without being able to connect with people on their devices we're adding yet another hurdle for them and the thing i tell parents is don't focus so much on how much time yeah. look at what they're doing and if you're terrified about cyberbullying and putting bad photos on and the creepy people out there which there are instead of keeping them away from their phones, which then they don't learn, teach them and educate them on how to use it correctly. All so right. that's what my focus is on them. All right, then. Good. Um, what are some common problems people are coming to you with these days then? Uh, I guess you've, I mean, we've covered a lot of things and a lot of examples, yeah. but is there anything else that you haven't that you're saying, oh, also I can, I can mention that this is coming up frequently because of this. Anything at all that comes to yeah. mind? Uh, yeah, well, before all this even, anxiety has been in a growing, growing problem. Um, okay. I went to a com conference on teen development, and I think 85% of the, of the sessions were just on anxiety. I'm like, oh my God, like that's it. Now, it's even worse. So if kids were already struggling with anxiety, now they've got it to an nth degree, right? Anger, mm -hmm. too. I think there's anger and, anger and anxiety, I think, come from the same place. Yep. Um, and it's the sense of overwhelm. It's a sense of feeling like they're not enough trying to prove people. Um, and part of the problem I think is there's a lot of issues. So I can't, you know, it's all individual. So I don't want to say this is the problem, fix this. But no. it, one of the problems I see is we kind of, again, went overboard when it came to trying to make our kids feel good and praising them. And what we end up up doing is we praise them saying you're so smart you're so talented you're so good and these are going back to the generics and if we tell a kid kid they're smart instead of them believing they're smart they start worrying that they're going to prove you wrong and kids that are told they're smart a lot will start avoiding things that could prove them wrong these are the kids that may start cheating these are the kids that'll take easier courses or get stressed out in their classes because they don't want to get anything less than an A because now they're proving you wrong. So instead it's focusing on effort and showing them that they have the power to do what they need to do. And it's not just this innate ability that they either have or don't have and they have no control over. Mm -hmm. And when we start being able to take more control and feel more empowered and feel like, there's something we can do, our anxiety starts going down mm -hmm. because it's in our hands now. It's not just this vague, oh my gosh, I don't know how to hold on to that. What I, what I hear in this, Dr. Cam, is kind of the, my view of self-esteem, which I think that that idea of praising people or just telling them they're smart and all that stuff is more of a subjective view because it's not based on any objective evidence. And then therefore, that's what makes people scared or the, especially teens or anybody, anybody. If I just try to tell myself I'm anybody. this kind yeah. of person, it doesn't mean I am. I have to see evidence and reality of it. So what we want to do as parents, perhaps I would say, is you want to give them opportunities and guide them on how to have positive experiences and success and, and doing things and achieving things. And then they're going to build self-esteem and they won't have that idea of like, I got to avoid things because I'll be found out that I'm right. not this great person. My mom says. And the, that, and the other really big thing that I think is really tough for parents, including myself mm -hmm. is letting our kids fail. It's one of the biggest gifts we can give our kids is giving them the opportunity to fail. Parents don't want their kids to fail. They don't want them to get hurt. We jump in, we clear the way, we fix it. We do all of these things to prevent our kids from feeling pain. And all that does is tell the our, sends the message that we don't think our kids have the capacity to fix it. We tell them the message that failing is bad and we get them to fear failure. And we want 
them to not fear failure. We want them to realize that failure is the step to success, right? And we want them to, to be able to deal with failure and learn how to deal with failure when we're there to help coach them through. All right. So, yeah, I like that formulation of it. Uh, you know, I agree completely. And I like how, how that was put. Um, we were we were talking about COVID uh, just before. And uh, I have a question I think is important in it. How can we use the pandemic to strengthen family con- uh, connections? If there's a lot of problems we have to deal with, but how can we use it? Oh, it is some of the parents, some parents I've talked to, and this is this has been the big silver lining. It's this opportunity where, okay, our kids are forced to stay at home. Like parents are love, a lot of parents are loving this. My kid doesn't have to get, you know, they're, they have to stay home and they're using this to just create family time, like family dinners again, because everyone's not racing around. We can all sit down together mm-hmm. or playing family games or going on hikes or doing things like this. And people have really taken and made use of this. And my, my hope is that when things get back to normal and schedules get crazy that people will start prioritizing this because we this always ends up being the first thing to go that will start prioritizing now i want to make a caveat here because when i talk about this i have a lot of parents that come out upset by that because they're like well i'm trying my teen won't come down you know and now i feel like i'm failing because you're telling me i should be using this time and i can't get my team to tell me so in those situations, use that time to be, you got to be slow, you got to chip away at it, but use those times to listen to your kids, to empathize with your kids, and to slowly meet them where they're at. One of the best ways to do that is show interest in what they love. If they love video games, and I remember my nephew teaching me World of Warcraft, and I yeah. was terrible all i could do is hop side to side and like it bounce into walls but i did it because he oh god so bad (laughs) but he i did it because that's what he loved and he we would do that and laugh and have fun and he would talk to me and Mm -hmm. so even if it's not something you understand or are interested in if your teen loves it then you love it and get, get into it and ask them to teach you and that is the best way to start making those inroads and developing that relationship that you may have lost do a tiktok dance is that do a tiktok dance it's fun (laughs) and i imagine you are going to have fun you were scared of going in and then you played world of warcraft and then you had fun messing up you said that was your nephew is that right did you say it was my nephew yeah, we, so he's yeah, like, we had fun laughing at how bad funny. i was yeah, right. yeah we still laugh about how bad i was <laughs> whatever <laughs> all right great um i i was gonna ask you you have a new series i don't know if you're calling it a podcast I, forgive me is it a, a series of videos or something um can you tell me a little bit about that right now and why, why you started and how yeah. you're enjoy, enjoying it and all that i've seen yeah some. so yeah what i oh good so in july I made my own challenge that I was going to get on Facebook Live every morning at 9.30 Eastern, 9.30 a.m. Eastern, and do a Facebook Live every weekday. Mm -hmm. And I did this because, first of all, I was terrified. Talk about, like, doing something out of your comfort zone. It was something I was not comfortable with doing. And so I challenged myself and said, I'm going to do this. It's okay if I fail, if I make a jerk of myself. And I did. I did a whole 15 minutes with my mic off. So it was just me animated, you know, which is lovely. Um, And I survived it. And so now I'm going on it and I've turned it into a YouTube channel and I'm doing it, turning it into iTunes, um, into a podcast. And every day I just go on for 15 minutes and talk about whatever somebody has asked me about. I mean, one of them was on suicide because during the weekend, um, a friend of mine called me because she was worried about her daughter's friend who had just said, texted her these scary texts. And she was, so we talked about that. So it's kind of whatever, but I just talk about what's going on um, with me and my daughter. My daughter did one all by herself, which was amazing. Um, and we just I saw her on your show, yeah. Life. Did you? She was yeah. awesome. We just talk about what it's like to be parenting teens and just going in and doing that. And I, I'm actually really enjoying it now. I really love it. So I'll keep it going. 
is not something. And, and I, I agree that I've said to a couple of people before that sometimes when there's something that I feel a little scared about, I usually just say yes as a rule because I know that I'm probably yeah. going to grow. And even yeah. this kind of thing, right? Imagine I'm talking, talking to you about this and I can be scared that I'm, you know, this is not my expertise. I might sound like an idiot asking you dumb questions or something, but I just say, I want to do this and get in and, yeah. you know, I can get better at it and I can get some value out of somebody like this. So I'm always really glad I did it. I'm glad you're doing it and enjoying it. Um, yeah. It's the right, it's the right attitude. Um, That's right. Yeah. I, I want to, and I'm going to ask you uh, in, in just a, a moment where everybody can find that and, and everything else about you. Um, I guess I kind of asked you about this earlier, um, kind of a final big question. How would you characterize an optimistic view of adolescence? Generally. Um, I would, the generalized view is that adolescence is the period where people are, these kids are coming into their own. They're determining and deciding who they are as a person. It's when they're developing their loves, their interests, finding what they put them in the flow. Um, they're passionate. These kids still believe they can save the world. I was talking to one client the other day and she was getting really into the Black Lives Matters and had dragged her parents to do some protests and really loved it. And she said, I can't wait till I'm older and I can do something. And I stopped right there and I said, wait, what? You can do something right now. In fact, before you're, you know, you got family and mortgages and all these other life stressors, now you can probably do more than I can. So understanding that these kids, if we just believe in them and let them loose, they can change the world because they want to. Mm -hmm. And they've got the energy and the passion to do it and to really appreciate these them as human beings and as people and not just as these kids that we have to like control and, you know, teach and lecture. And, you know, I, I think we get in these, and be fearful of cycles yeah. of that and we don't even real yeah and we don't even realize it and again teenagers are some of the most amazing people i've met they're uh -huh. they're amazing right and appreciates one of my big words so i like i have that in there at the end um before i you know ask people where they can or ask you excuse me where people can find you and say a final word mm -hmm. um is there anything else that you wanted to bring up maybe something i didn't ask you that you would think is you know something i you wish i had asked you or something the only thing is I, I am very focused on how parents, you know, what parents need to do and how we kind of need to change. I always want to put in there to give yourself grace too. I have a lot of parents that beat themselves up. They feel like a failure. If they're listening to something like this, if they are interested in pursuing something and they have that concern, they're already ahead of the game and to give themselves some grace. We know you're doing the best you can. We know you're doing it from the right place. And I, I just really, as a parent, I know how hard we can be on ourselves. All right, well, I really appreciate that final word. Um, thank you for that. Um, before, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where can people, excuse me, uh, before my final word, I guess, uh, where can people go mm -hmm. to learn more about you, connect with you? and your work. Sure. So I made it really easy. I just have www.askdrcam.com and that will take you to my website. And there you can email me if you have a question. Um, you can set up a free call with me. I do a free, my first session is free. If you want a personalized chat about something going on with your teen, I love doing that. Um, so just askdrcam.com. Go ask Dr. Cam. There you go. Um, and I didn't. And what I did uh, omit was to mention to listeners to please share this video as well because I know it can be a lot of value to people. I mean, you, you know somebody with teens. You know somebody who's gonna have teens. And as I said, it it, it matters yeah. to us all how we as a society raise our teens. So share this around and and expose people to Dr. Cam and and uh, and then you can further ask questions at uh, as she just said and we'll make sure it's a. a clear for everybody. Oh, perfect. Yeah. And, um, and as well, ask, uh, you can ask questions on, uh, just on the chat, wherever you consume, like YouTube, for example, or on the Mr. Brightside Facebook page, that's facebook.com slash matthewbolton.ca. If you have a question about this show and it's directed at Dr. Cam, I'll make sure it gets redirected to her. Um, if, if somehow you find that easier. 
All right. And as to listeners, I, I repeat again, check out Dr. Cam and shift your mindset and view of adolescence. I wish all teens and parents a healthy and enjoyable relationship of understanding and appreciation. I really care about that. Uh, Dr. Cam, thanks for coming on. I appreciate having you on and sharing your wisdom and expertise here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was fun. All right. Great. Um, everybody else, I'll see you next time then. Mr. Brightside, your time out to refresh, refuel, and refocus your mind and energy toward building an optimistic framework for flourishing. Life is good. It's up to you to choose the bright side.